Welcome to Mayo Clinic Sleep Medicine Podcasts, a series for physicians, advanced practice providers, nurses, and other health practitioners treating sleep disorders or interested in learning about state-of-the-art advances in sleep medicine and sleep health. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Silber. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Maitri Juna. We are both consultants at the Center for Sleep Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Thank you all for joining us for today's podcast titled Idiopathic Hypersomnia, Current Diagnosis and Treatment. In the past, idiopathic hypersomnia has taken a backseat to narcolepsy. However, more recent data suggests that it is at least as common and possibly more common than narcolepsy. To discuss current concepts in the diagnosis and management of this condition, my guest today is Dr. Michael Silber, Professor of Neurology and a board-certified sleep specialist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Mike, thank you for joining us today. Is idiopathic hypersomnia a well-defined entity, and how does it overlap with narcolepsy? Well, thank you, my three. Idiopathic hypersomnia is regrettably not a well-defined entity, and we have to be very careful with the diagnosis. There are a number of other conditions that have to always be thought of and pretty much ruled out. So let's consider them one by one. The first would be chronic fatigue. Um, I try hard to separate out fatigue and sleepiness from my patients. And the way I do it is I say, look, these are just words. You can use them any way you like. Let me define them for you, how I think about these two words. And let's see if we can work out together what your what you are experiencing. And then I say, you know, sleepiness is a deep yawn. Your eyes want to droop shut. Your head feels if it's dropping to your shoulder, your chest. You feel overwhelming. Sleepiness is about to overcome you. And if you sit down, pretty inevitably, you're going to doze off for at least a few seconds. That sleepiness. And then I contrast it to the patient with fatigue, which I describe as, no, I'm not sleepy. My, I just no longer have the physical energy in my body to do the physical things I should be able to do. My muscles feel exhausted. My body feels tired. And if I'm so fatigued, I have to lie down. I may fall asleep. I may not. But if I do fall asleep, it's different from that irresistible, inappropriate dozing off that sleepiness. So when I do that, often it's straightforward. The patient will tell me, no, no, it is, it's all fatigue um, or it's all sleepiness. But of course, <laughs> sometimes a patient, as one I had this morning, said it was both. And then we have to probe it in more detail. And sometimes they really can't differentiate. It is very hard for some patients to sort out those sort of symptoms. So we have to think of chronic fatigue as a differential for idiopathic hypersomnia. Second, let's consider the sleepy patient who doesn't have cataplexy, doesn't have sleep apnea. Um, we're thinking of idiopathic hypersomnia. We always have to be absolutely sure we've ruled out chronic sleep deprivation, um, which of course is one of the commonest causes of sleepiness. And if we're preparing somebody for sleep studies, and I think we're going to come to this a little later in the podcast, it's so essential in this setting to be absolutely sure that we've ruled out sleep deprivation before we start diagnosing idiopathic hypersomnia. The third issue is perhaps even more difficult, and that is depression. When I started in sleep medicine, we sort of taught the dogma or believed the dogma that people who are sleepy and depressed, it's very easy because they have normal multiple sleep latency tests. I mean, they may have a little little early sleep latency because of depression is associated with a shorter latency, but it's not usually under 15 minutes. But their mean latency is over 10 minutes, so it's very easy to separate it all out. We now know that's not always true and work from, especially from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, has shown that perhaps 25% of patients with active depression have latencies on MSLT eight minutes or less, which is, of course, in the range that we're going to be starting thinking of idiopathic hypersomnia. What do we think about these patients? Do they have depression and idiopathic hypersomnia? Presumably most don't. So we have to use a lot of clinical judgment in a patient who has active depression 
and is sleepy. Now, if once the depression is well controlled, and often they send to us as sleep specialists, once the psychiatrist feels the depression's controlled and they're still sleepy, we have to ask, do they also then have idiopathic hypersomnia or is it some residual sleepiness related to the depression? Very difficult and a lot of clinical judgment needed. And the final one I'll bring out is what you started the question about in my three, and that's narcolepsy. Now, narcolepsy type one is generally easy because the vast majority have cataplexy. But if you've just got a sleepy patient and you've done an MSLT and they've got a short latency and two or more SOREMs, of course, we're going to diagnose narcolepsy type two. Now, what most of us don't do is ever repeat the MSLT again, of course, but there've been studies showing that when you do that, it sometimes changes. And similarly, if we have an idiopathic hypersomnia patient with a short latency and no SOREMs or one SOREM, and we repeat the MSLT, it can change and they can drift in and out of SOREMs. So some patients with narcolepsy type two on another study might look like idiopathic hypersomnia and some with idiopathic hypersomnia might change and look like narcolepsy type two. So this is a complex interrelationship. And there's been recently a suggestion that perhaps we should reclassify um, narcolepsy type 2 and nonspecific idiopathic hypersomnia, something called narcolepsy spectrum disorder, and fuse them together because we don't really know what the underlying pathophysiology is, but that's not been accepted yet by the field. Um, so it is difficult. And the reason it's so difficult is we don't have biologic markers for idiopathic hypersomnia which is probably more than one condition. And I guess that would take us on to the question of how do we even diagnose the condition? So with these cautions in mind then, Mike, how does one go about diagnosing a patient with idiopathic hypersomnia then? Well, the usual way we think about it, and if you look at ICSD-2, um, was simply a sleepy patient, not, not sleep deprived, no cataplexy, no sleep apnea, no medications causing it, no circadian rhythms causing it. We do an MSLT, the mean sleep latency is eight minutes or less, and there's fewer than two SOREMs. Easy, simple, idiopathic hypersomnia. And that's probably fine. And many of patients who we call idiopathic hypersomnia fulfill that criterion and we're, the, and we're done. Um, but we do know that there are other patients who are sleepy and don't have latencies of less than eight minutes. Many of these fit what I call the classic phenotype. So that takes us back again to ICSD-2, where we classified idiopathic hypersomnia into two subgroups, idiopathic hypersomnia with long sleep and idiopathic hypersomnia without long sleep. In ICSD-3, we eliminated that distinction because it wasn't clear enough that there were biologic markers to separate those two groups. But even with that distinction removed, I think everybody accepts there's a subgroup of idiopathic hypersomnia patients we could call the classic phenotype. And these are patients with long, deep sleep at night huge amounts of sleep inertia on trying to wake up in the morning, um, long undisturbed um, sleep in naps during the day if you don't wake them up, and these naps are always unrefreshing. And when you do do polysomnography, very high sleep efficiency, usually greater than 90%. So that's a subgroup. And many of those patients may have normal sleep latencies. So Isabel Arnold from Paris and her group some years ago said, let's look at a different way of diagnosing those patients. And they put together a complex protocol of keeping them in the sleep lab. I think it was for um, a night, a day and another night and measuring, among other things, the total sleep time when allowed to just unrestrictedly sleep during the day and night. And they came up with a cutoff of 660 minutes, which is 11 hours. And they said if over a 24 hour period, period, a patient sleeps for 660 minutes or more, even if their latency on MSLT is less than eight minutes, that's abnormal and we'll call that idiopathic hypersomnia or at least a subgroup of idiopathic hypersomnia. Now, when we came to put ICSD-3 together, we looked at this very carefully and we realized, of course, in the US, this is completely impractical. Nobody's going to do 24-hour polysomnographies. Our labs are not set up for it. Insurance will not pay for it. So we decided to put in place a criterion where we would substitute for that a week of 
actigraphy under the absolute condition that the person is allowed unrestricted sleep. They can't set alarms and go to work during that week. They've got to just sleep as long as they wish for those seven days. And we said if the average 24-hour sleep time on that actigraphy was grade 60 minutes or more, that would be a criterion for idiopathic hypersomnia despite a normal sleep latency. Now, of course, that was not standardized or anything. We simply extrapolated it empirically from the French polysomnography study. So some patients will fulfill that criterion as an alternative one. So those are the two ways we diagnose it. We rule out other causes. Um, we do the MSLT. Um, and if the MSLT is normal, hopefully the preceding actigraphy, which should go before the MSLT and the polysomnogram, will show the 660 minutes. Very helpful, Mike. Thank you for that. So once a diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia is established, are there any FDA-approved medications for treatment of this condition? Well, I just love it when I can pick up those two SOREMs on the MSLT and call it narcolepsy type 2, because, of course, what's happened over the years is the drug companies have done the trials predominantly on narcolepsy. Once the medication is FDA approved for narcolepsy, they say, fine, you can use it off-label for idiopathic hypersomnia, but that doesn't mean insurances will pay for it. So we're very happy that we now have one FDA approved medication for idiopathic hypersomnia and that is lower sodium oxybate. Now, there are many forms of oxybate now available. That's the only one which is FDA approved. The trial was sort of interesting in that the investigators and the company were understandably concerned that if you gave the second dose of oxybate in the middle of the night, that might interfere with sleep inertia in the morning and put as an option for those patients, instead of two doses, one dose before bed up to a maximum of six grams rather than the usual maximum of nine grams. 4.5 and 4.5, and they um, found that it worked for idiopathic hypersomnia either way, and that even the people who took it during the night didn't get extra sleep inertia in the morning, which is really interesting, um, and it seems to be effective. That doesn't mean that oxybate is necessarily the first-line treatment for idiopathic hypersomnia, but the fact that it's FDA-approved just moves it higher on my list of medications to try for the condition. So knowing that we have only one FDA-approved medication for management of idiopathic hypersomnia, Mike, what is your personal approach to managing this condition? Which drugs do you go to first? How easily can patients obtain these drugs? Well, it's often very difficult. Um, the drugs which are more likely to be covered would obviously be the cheaper drugs. Methylphenidate is usually not a problem, though some insurers are now having problems co uh, covering some of the controlled release forms of methylphenidate. Modafinil is usually not a problem, but not always. And But to try and get help, um, patients on patolicent or soriamfetol is very, very difficult indeed. Um, how do I go about it? Much the same way as I would with narcolepsy. I tend to start with modafinil or our modafinil if we can get coverage for it. If that doesn't work in some if appropriate patients, I might add oxybate or substitute oxybate at that point because, because it's FDA approved, of course, with all the usual precautions that they don't have untreated sleep apnea or other primary res respiratory disorders and they're not on sedatives or hypnotics or using alcohol, etc. Um, if that doesn't work, then I might try to get coverage for soriamfetol, patolicent, but often I'll move to methylphenidate at that point because it's just easier for the patient. And then if that doesn't work, we'll, and we can't get coverage for soriamfetol or patolicent, I guess we'll move on to the amphetamines just as I would with um, narcolepsy. So it's no different from the management of narcolepsy other than the insurance problems. Um, when I get denials, which is very, very often, I write letters of appeal. And one of the, what I try put in the appeal is idiopathic hypersomnia is exactly the same as narcolepsy. The only difference is that they don't have premature REM sleep. Otherwise, it's a pretty identical condition. I often refer them to the ASM practice parameter, which says that methylphenidate, patolicent, modafinil, and oxybate are indicated for um, 
for idiopathic hypersomnia. Interestingly, sorry, I'm for told the time that it was put together. There were no studies on it, so it's not included in the current ASM protocol. Whether that makes a difference depends on the insurance company, whether they accept my arguments. Some of them simply say you've got to try two other drugs before you use the more expensive ones, and that's fine. We work through the process. Most of my patients with idiopathic hypersomnia, we can get appropriate medication for, but it's a battle, and I would recommend to providers that they don't give up at least a letter of appeal, um, but always read carefully the reason for the denial, because sometimes it's in the small print there. They'll tell you if you use these two drugs and it doesn't work, they'll approve the third drug. Um, and you, you just have to work as with them as much as you can. But if they deny it a second time, there's often a little more that we can do. I haven't had much success with peer to further peer-to-peer -peer, um, discussions at that point, though that can be done. Occasionally, a Medicare patient asks me whether I'm prepared to help them with an appeal before an administrative judge. I've done it once or twice. It hasn't been helpful. Helpful. So we do the best we can, obviously. That's very helpful, Mike. And in particular, just hearing your strategy about how you approach the insurance denial piece as well. What final messages would you like to leave with our listeners today? Well, this is a real diagnosis. Despite all those differentials, there is a group of patients with this idiopathic hypersomnia that we don't fully understand. And it may be commoner. I think it's more common than narcolepsy, actually, the whole spectrum of it. So take care with the diagnosis. Don't overcall it, rule out chronic fatigue, the whole issue of depression, difficult one. Um, don't um, don't overdiagnose this, but please don't also exclude patients from consideration of treatment because sometimes we can transform lives with adequate um, stimulants. Be aware of how we diagnose it, the two different ways of getting objective um, pr proof of sleepiness, and then um, develop your own approach to treatment using the available drugs, um, being aware of what's FDA approved and what isn't and how best to appeal denials. Um, I do find that I can help most of my idiopathic hypersomnia patients probably close to as, maybe not quite as well as the narcoleptic patients, but pretty well indeed. But it often takes effort and time, especially with the few FDA, the only single FDA approved drug. So it is worth taking time and trouble with them, with these patients. We really can help a lot of them. Thanks very much for sharing your expertise with us today, Mike, and to our listeners, thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. If so, please tune in again through wherever you receive your podcasts as we discuss further topics in sleep medicine and sleep health. Thank you. Thank you.